to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Have you all settled into 2019? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, simply the number one Bitcoin podcast in Bedford. I am your host, Peter McCormack, and today I have an interview with Chua Demista discussing his bearish case for Ethereum. But first, I do have a message from my show sponsors. So let's talk about BlockFi. Regular listeners will know these guys. They have been a long-term sponsor of the podcast. And what has been really interesting to note is that I've had a bunch of conversations with people recently about the podcast and people telling me that they've been checking BlockFi out. They're really interested in what they're doing. They maybe don't have a need for a loan right now, but they're interested in the products that are coming and they've been registering for their newsletter or following them on Twitter. So that's really cool. They've got loads of interesting stuff going to be happening this year. So yes, keep an eye out for them. But if you are interested in a loan, whether you're paying off a credit card or buying a house, BlockFi helps crypto investors use their Bitcoin, Ether and Litecoin without selling. BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender in the US. They service over 46 states and their interest rates start as low as 7.9%. So if you visit BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can learn more about using your crypto without having to sell. And also, have you checked out my other lead sponsor packs for yet? Come on, you got to check these guys out. They have the most comprehensive options for buying Bitcoin that I've ever seen. They accept the normal bank transfers, debit and credit cards, PayPal, Western Union, but they have so many more options. It's kind of mind blowing. If you go on the website, you can see there's over 300 payment options for buying Bitcoin. So go and check them out. They are also a true peer to peer Bitcoin marketplace. They have a full service escrow system and they also offer 24 seven support. These guys are awesome. They're a proper Bitcoin company. Go and check them out. That's Paxful.com, P-A-X-F-U-L.com. Okay, so onto my interview with Tour, and this is my second interview with him. So a little bit of a background. He's been on before. He was on episode 32, where we discussed Bitcoin, but also touched on some issues that Tour has with Ethereum. I wouldn't usually have a guest back so quickly, but recently he dropped a tweet storm explaining why he is so against Ethereum. Kind of blew up, lots of discussion, lots of counterpoints, lots of counter arguments. So... Listen, I approached Tua. I said to him, would you mind coming on and discussing it with me? I think sometimes maybe with a tweet storm, it comes across as like really in your face and kind of aggressive. But actually, you know, getting to know Tua, he's very considerate about what he writes. You know, so I said to him, look, let's come on, let's discuss it. Let's make it a kind of balanced discussion around the issues he has, because, you know, I don't understand it all. And I don't agree with everything he has to say. So having the chance to debate it and, you know, knock it back and forth over the podcast, I thought would be a great idea. Now, while I agree with a lot of Tua's points, I don't agree with everything. And I would happily have someone on to discuss it from the Ethereum side. So listen, Vitalik, not sure if you listen to my show. Preethi, not sure if you listen to my show. I'm not sure if anyone who loves Ethereum listens to my show. But look, if there's anyone who's entrenched within the community, they want to come on the show, discuss the counter arguments, more than happy to do it. Just reached out to me on hello at whatbitcointed.com. I think... Anyone who knows my show knows I try to do a balanced and fair interview, so we'll happily do that with you. Just a couple of notes, though. If you haven't read the tweet storm by Tua, please do read that before listening to the interview. I've added a link to that in the show notes. Also, the name for the show, I've got to say, The Bearish Case for Ethereum. This came from Vijay Boyapati when I did my interview with him discussing the bullish case for Bitcoin. He said he's looking to write a follow-up, which is The Bearish Case for Ethereum. I approached him. I said, look, I want a title this show the bearish case for ethereum are you okay with that and he said yeah no problem so listen when he does write the article you got to know that the title for that came from him okay so listen look if you do want to support the show there's a whole bunch of things you can do We've got so much support recently so thank you so much everyone there is a section on my website if you head over to www.whatbitcoindid.com you can see there's a support section there's all different things you can do even just leaving a review on itunes helps me out also, I do want to thank my first patron top tier supporter, Elite Crypto Consulting, your personalized trading teacher. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Okay, so on to the interview. If you have any questions, you know you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindig.com and I look forward to hearing from you. Hi there, Arthur. How are you? Hey, Peter. How's it going? I'm good, thank you. Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah, yeah. I had so much fun this year. Yeah, it was great. Excellent. Okay, I didn't think I would get to interview again so quickly after our last one, but obviously you've put out a tweet storm this week that's uh, raised some awareness of yourself and put out some thoughts with regards to Ethereum. So obviously I approached you. I said, I think it might be good to record a discussion around this because I think sometimes people might take something too aggressively. So I thought it'd be good to get you on, have a talk about it. And also some of the things are quite complex. You know, I'm not the most technical and I always want to learn. So I think it'd be good to go through some of this with you. But I think it might be helpful just as a way to set up, if you could just give a background 
to why you did this tweet storm and how much work went into it? Yeah, yesterday I went a few times like, oh my God, what did I do? Because <laughs> uh, it, 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 I thought it would be, you know, people would read it, but it, it had a, there was a lot more um, kind of pro and con debate than I expected, which, which is nice, but it, it kind of, it was, it was bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, where it came from, um, it was really um, this, this, tweet that I put out about um, comparing Ethereum with um, uh, with this utopian ideology of, of Marxism and not not everything about that ideology but in particular three aspects and uh, I just briefly highlighted that where I saw potentially some parallels um, and it was a serious tweet I was I was um, you know it, it just really grinds me rubs me the wrong way um when um people try to monetize ideas that are not viable and that present them as viable um and so that's that's utopianism uh, and we've seen a lot of that in the crypto space um and so vitalik's response to that uh i was just you know uh i was really annoyed by and and it also fits in a pattern um where he will like quip back as if uh, and and so he basically said oh i could play that game too and then um proceeded with like three semi identical criticisms to bitcoin which were uh factually wrong uh logically didn't make sense but on the surface it kind of you know was like oh he got back at me and it just really it just really got to me i was just very annoyed and i didn't want to because the traditional way to, to you know that people respond is like oh they'll they'll get back to him and like they'll have like a longer response to why he's wrong but by then all his followers have like mostly they kind of lost interest and they moved on and 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 the the memory remains that like oh you know he won this debate even though he the only thing he did was dodge the question and so that was really the I don't know, it doesn't sound like inspiring, but it was kind of the emotion that was like, all right, I just, I want to put out something uh, to put this into context. It's like, why, why am I annoyed about this? And, and I, I think that went into the tweet storm. And I wonder maybe that's why uh, it got so much response because I think a lot of people have felt this way about, and I don't want to single out Vitalik, but like, um, you know about uh, the people that are carrying the torch for ethereum that there's um there's a fair amount of um what i would call opportunism or um you know sloppiness and um um just a lack of dedication to really getting to the bottom and and being intellectually honest um and uh, and then also you know be having healthy business ethics as well and you're not just some self-labeled bitcoin maximalist reading twitter <laughs> twitter read it all day drafting tweet storms attacking non-bitcoin people all just to defend your bitcoin it's ironic because i mean uh i pretty much vitalik called me a bitcoin maximalist so it's kind of like well yeah i guess you can just repeat that word um but no i mean i i i I could have invested in Ethereum. I could have invested in like Mastercoin was the um, the original inspiration for Ethereum. It was um, it was going to be a way to issue tokens on top of Bitcoin, kind of like a colored coin experiment. Um, like there's been so many things that have been available for me and anyone to invest in, and so and it's also why like. I feel some self attack if I read back the tweet storm. Like there's some tweets that I'm like, oh, you know, I should have, you know, this word should have been a bit different, or uh, I should have used a different source to illustrate this point. Um, but um, it's also like I don't, I don't have any anything going on this. Like it's, it's not like I have a big Ethereum short that I'm, I, I'm flat versus Ethereum. Like I don't have any, any except for. And I tried to explain this, um, like the stake that I have is just that right now people don't talk about the Bitcoin space, they talk about the crypto space. And so in 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 the eyes of 
new investors or people who are kind of looking at the space or institutions even, um, they look at the top five assets. And so Ethereum is in there and, and a number of other ones too. And so the reputation or the technology of those tokens are going to influence how people's perception of Bitcoin is because it's all part of the same basket in, in their minds. And so and Ethereum is often described as a blue chip, like, oh, like it's it's all these ICO were la- ICOs were launched on top of it. And so it, it, it's, you know, it, it, it must be exemplary in, in the crypto space as like a project that that um, really shows what blockchain can do. And um, and so in my mind, um, it doesn't live up to ex- original expectations. It doesn't live up to its current expectations. Uh, and a lot of investors don't know this. They don't know why. And uh, and I think it's it's kind of uh, tainting uh, Bitcoin to some extent. Like it's it's really, yeah. So so that's that's what I wanted to like. Uh, and, and that's my my stake in this game. It's just like I, I don't like that Bitcoin's reputation is is being tainted. And interestingly, I noticed on Stefan Levera's podcast recently, he's been pushing the. Bitcoin not crypto narrative which is a quite interesting follow on from Bitcoin not blockchain and i guess some of the damage has been done where people start to think about index of crypto assets right coinbase have an index and other people have an index they're almost uh, aligning these different currencies together and they should all be considered together but you see such fundamental differences it's very important therefore for you to separate what is bitcoin from everything else yeah, it's kind of like in the 90s, if you had an index of like search engine companies um, and, and and you know, say that you and I were like, we live in Silicon Valley and we know the Google guys and we know the other guys. And of course, people are working hard. Like, I, I think that's, I could have acknowledged that in my tweet storm. It's like, you know, there are people that, uh, out there who are putting their heart and soul into their Ethereum projects. And I, I admire entrepreneurship, like I, I really do. And so I feel bad that I didn't like um, highlight some of that. Um, um, but at the same time, it's like, I I, I don't want people to, um, you know, I, I can only share what I think is true. And so I, I don't want to disparage people to be entrepreneurs, but at the same time, if I think a platform ha- doesn't have any long-term merit, I want to say it so that, uh, who knows? It just contributes to the general uh, discussion. But so, yeah, like the, those indices um, where you kind of throw together 10 coins and then, of course, you are going to your results financially are to some extent going to reflect um, how how the space uh, performs because you rebalance. And, you know, if Bitcoin uh, gains traction, you're going to have a bigger portion of that. Um, but I don't think that's the best way necessarily to invest or at least what i've been saying is that i think um aside from your multi-coin basket i think you should have a basket dedicated to bitcoin like it shouldn't just be like one of just like if you are going to invest in search engines i think it's important to acknowledge and, and and we're talking maybe like the year 2003 or 2002 like it's important to acknowledge that there's a qualitative difference between Uh, Google and a Yahoo, for example. Right. Okay. And there would have been plenty of times that Bitcoin has been written off in its journey over the last 10 years. It still is being so, but especially in its early days, people would have had their doubts. Maybe even people, high profile people who've been involved from the project from the start. Maybe even yourself, Arthur, there were times where you perhaps had your doubts. Um, is it not fair that Ethereum also has doubters and therefore it deserves the opportunity to be experimented upon? Or is there something fundamentally different here that you think deserves analysis? Yeah, I mean, I'm a free market guy. So, of course, if people want to build something and they, they want to rally investors around them, that's 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 great. Uh, to me, whether, you know, where I draw the line and, of course, the interpretation of that is is difficult, but it's like, it's dishonesty. Like, you know, are you being straightforward about um, what you're doing? Are you being transparent about the, the research that historically has been done in the field that you claim to innovate in? Uh, are you, uh, are your business plans somewhat realistic? Do you have internal accountability 
um, what are your financial interests left and right? Like, you know, maybe you advise, I, I'm talking as if I'm talking about an individual, but I think it can apply to communities and organizations as well. Um, you know, like there's a lot of buzzwords that Ethereum uses like decentralization, censorship resistance, um, smart contracts. Um, and, and the implication is like, we are the smart contract platform, for example, even though Bitcoin has had smart contracts from day one, um, even though right now, today, you can issue tokens on Bitcoin and, and it's it's starting to happen, uh, even though um, Bitcoin has been genuinely censorship resistant and Ethereum totally has not. So it's like, um, and, and the decentralization is that, I mean, that in itself, you could, you know, you could talk for hours about um, how do you measure decentralization? And, and so f to me, I, I'm looking for integrity. Like I'm looking for people that are really dedicated to principles and that I want to see that shown in their actions. And so, for example, from the Ethereum community, I don't see real research being done. And like, how do we keep this thing decentralized, for example? Like, how do we prevent this one company in Fura from, um, or, or I even... How do we measure? How do we measure the level of centralization at this point? I, I can't find the data. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's a concern of mine. There's a lot of indicators that it's going the wrong way. Uh, I've actually asked someone at the SEC, like, is it, um, you know, do you think it's possible that um, even though Ethereum started as uh, security, which was, you know, centra central, the ICO was centralized, and then it was deemed to be um, just an asset, no longer a security because it became decentralized. Well, what if, because of what we're talking about, this blockchain bloat stuff, what if Ethereum becomes centralized again? Could it then be uh, deemed a security again? And, um, and, and uh, he didn't like in depth agree with me and in terms of like in a lot of words, but he definitely did not. Uh, tell me like, no, that wouldn't happen. You cannot go from a commodity to a security. Um, anyway, so, so whenever I air concerns there, it's like, what if there's a judge who orders, um, you know, who says this big Ethereum balance is, um, is um, uh, the balance of a thief. It's the result of a theft. We need to move these ether back to the, where they came from. Um, and so I'm going to order in Fura um, or uh, to um, who runs most of the Ethereum nodes to just uh, start uh, uh, deploying this new client, a hard for client that claws back all the funds to where they came from. Wouldn't that set a precedent, right? Wouldn't that be a precedent that um, Ethereum is centralized because it can be court ordered around? I've asked that question and people have like literally mocked me for doing that. And so it's kind of like, you know those those things, and it's been that's it's been like this for years. It really makes me wonder, like how how dedicated are you to these principles, or are they buzzwords that you use to um, to kind of excite investors? And where do you feel you are with the like? What's your view on securities laws? Because I've seen when people have an issue, say with uh, Ethereum or Ripple. They will often bring up, oh, it's an unregistered security, but they are also the same kind of people who I expect find that securities rules are also discriminatory. So I sometimes I find it's a careful balance of, of using it being a security as an attack vector when you might actually yourself not agree with securities laws because, because they are discriminatory. Where are you with that? Well, I mean, I think cryptocurrencies are decentralized. If they're not decentralized, they're not cryptocurrencies. And decentralized means censorship resistant. And so it shouldn't matter what the law says. But of course, you know, if you are centralized and you're running like a startup, then you are going to have interference of judges and legal action and those kind of things. Um, and so it's relevant in that sense, like from an investment point of view, you, you want to take that into account as a, a risk vector or if 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 um, a startup is especially compliant with the law then that's a plus and you kind of take that into account um, but uh, and of course but, but uh, sorry but at the same time from an ethical point of view um, the way common law has been 
kind of grown over the years is, is there's a lot of common sense into that. Uh, like the, the, the Howey test, I think is very commonsensical. If, if, if somebody tries, to, if somebody sells you an apple, that's just a commodity and you buy the thing and then, and then that's it. Like from there on out, you are on your own. Um, but if somebody sells you this magical thing, which will produce income for you and it's going to grow and that income and that growth is coming from the efforts of these people that are running that company. So they're selling you security. Then of course it makes sense commonly, um, that these people who sell you that have a lot more responsibility even after the sale. If they've been lying about what this widget or what this token can do, it, it makes sense that they should have um, some liability there, even in you know whatever kind of society you like. So, so that's why I, you know I don't like to dismiss um, kind of the 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 spirit of securities laws. I think there is a lot of common sense in there. Okay. So before we dissect the tweet storm, I think my final question to you would be, it's kind of a two-sided question. The first bit is, is there any value in Ethereum? Is there anything there you actually like? Anything you think, if we get away from the dishonest behavior, is there anything you think, actually, that's worthy experiment, that's that's worthy for it to exist, that can do something that Bitcoin can't, I like that. And then how do you fundamentally see uh, Ethereum as different for Bitcoin? Not a full critique, but... If you had to kind of just very like in a, a like a one sentence summarize the difference between the two, how would you do that? Uh, you might have to repeat that second question, but the the, fr the first one. Um, so the value I see in Ethereum um, is has been first of all, I was surprised that there was demand for a blockchain that could contain a very wide array of information. Like that is something that they've shown that there's demand for. I don't know if it's viable long term, but that's been that's been really interesting. I think the the value economically speaking um, has been that they've demonstrated there is a lot of demand for um, uh, token issuance uh, in whatever form, if it's for securities or asset backed things or 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 even just um, kind of. Um, loyalty points and, and those kind of things. Um, and and it, I think it kind of shows that the system that we had was very bureaucratic and expensive. And so people really want to be able to, to have bottom up access to things like that. And then you could say smart contracts to some extent, I think we've seen because of Ethereum that there's demand for that too. Um, I mean, you could say to some extent they've um, attracted um, young people that want to develop um, on top of this platform. But that's where I kind of have m more concerns because if you attract people to crypto, quote unquote, and then they get disillusioned because your platform doesn't live up to its promises, well, is that a plus or is it actually a negative, right? Would you rather that they would have discovered you later on and then you had a, they had a solid platform to build upon? Um, so that's where I feel mixed. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, the, the big merit has been um, that there's showing that there's a significant demand for asset issuance on blockchains. Well, there's a demand for asset issuance. There's still to be proven whether there's a demand for people to actually own those assets long term. But yeah, still interesting. So the second part of the question was not uh, a critique of why Bitcoin is better than Ethereum. Um, if you had to summarize the main difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum to somebody who hasn't who doesn't understand much about either, how would you separate the two? Well, I would say that the main difference is that um, the vision behind Bitcoin is to create um, a ledger that is the most secure ledger in the world for storing value. And it, the vision behind it is to, to create a financial system on top of that. And, 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 um, the way to do the way that Bitcoin does that is by not compromising on um, the secure blockchain. It builds layers on top of that. Whereas from day one, the approach in Ethereum was to put a lot of things in the same layer and say, you know, basically compromise on the security side and 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 say, you know, 
um, we are we want a lot of functionality from day one, and so we're gonna have all these contracts run on the main blockchain. And so, and I think that's and it 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 doesn't create anything that Bitcoin cannot do. Uh, it just it just gives you results faster. It's kind of like Yahoo, who used manpower to index the internet. They had interns and, and young people who were just going over the internet and making these index pages for a uh, portal pages for everyone to browse. Um, that was that allowed them to start up fast and to show some results fast, but it ultimately was not scalable. So that's that's my I see that's where I see the difference is that Bitcoin is scalable. I'm afraid Ethereum is not. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll work through the tweet storm. I'm not going to go through every single tweet. I'm going to go through the main ones, the real kind of standout points for me. Um, obviously, you started by explaining um, why it's important for you to point out the flaws. And I think I wanted a summary of what that was, but I think you've already covered that. It's essentially, it just comes down to honesty and ensuring that any investor, whether retail institution, is fully aware what they're buying, aware of what they're buying into, which I think is fair. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Okay. So, and by the way, as I go through this, if I don't agree with you, I will say. Um, so let's start with. You pointed out that the architecture and culture are different between Bitcoin and Ethereum, yet claiming the same solutions. Can you expand on that? Yeah, and and this is contested like people say oh that's not true bitcoin doesn't do smart contracts or um uh, well first of all the most backlash that i've had is that ethereum has a different culture than bitcoin um uh, but i i stand by that i i you know um uh, i'm trying to think uh like for example the culture of um embracing hard forks as a way to um quote unquote upgrade the protocol um, the culture of, I would say, poor peer review, like uh, Ethereum has had uh, um, several attacks and, and has, a, has a long, and, and in response to that, there were upgrades launched, which are basically hard forks in very, very short order that were not peer reviewed, um, not, that didn't go through a thorough process. And so, you know, I would call that recklessness. I think there is a culture of, uh, of recklessness um, and uh, a culture as well of, of promises that are just not held up. And then a lack of internal debating culture. It's kind of like, you know, there's the leadership that or perceived leadership and people follow that and they wait for the leadership to kind of tell them what to do. Um, and then also there's this perceived idea of democracy, but then when you really look at how decisions are made, it's actually, you know, a lot more top down than, what you what you might suspect and then in bitcoin there's you know it, it's pretty clear if you look on social media or anything else like there's a lot more above board debating happening uh there's fears you know you could call it infighting but it's it's really kind of um the war of ideas it's it's much more clear and and, and i would say that uh, overall that's that's more healthy that's a, a healthier intellectual culture where people are really passionate about certain principles. Like, I mean, uh, Luke Jr., I think is a good example. Like, um, yeah, he, he thinks the current block size is too big. Like, he thinks that um, the blockchain of Bitcoin is growing too fast and he has uh, arguments for that. And, and, uh, and he's a very well-respected um, developer and, and he's, he's made major contributions Um and and but he has a lot of viewpoints that a lot of people don't agree with, and he's there's always debate going on, um, but but he's not being um, silenced or anything, or it's like he his voice doesn't get lost in in the crowd. Um, anyway, so so yeah, cultural differences and then architectural difference is really um, it's interesting because more and more Ethereum is actually going towards Bitcoin's architecture which is a bit ironic because originally it was like we put everything in the main chain and we do on-chain scaling, but now um, payment channels are, are, are being, you know, kind of put forward as the way to scale Ethereum. For a while it was side chains uh, or a combination of those. Uh, and and it's, it's more clear to them that you can't do everything. You can't do a, a Dropbox on Ethereum or you can't do a, a Twitter on Ethereum um, on the main chain, I mean. And so the irony of that is that 
well, because you opened it up to put all this functionality in the main chain, you made it less secure. And now you're going to follow Bitcoin's lead in, in modular scaling. But in a way, the cat is already out of the bag because you have an insecure culture. Um, you have a culture that doesn't know how to create this really solid um, infrastructure. And so how are you going to yeah, put, put the genie back in the bottle? Yeah, it's interesting you should say that. I was about to bring up Luke's name as well myself as an example because I saw a recent presentation of his um, from his patron where he was talking about protecting people's Bitcoin. Everything should be to ensure that people's Bitcoin are protected. And one of the things I've come to appreciate over the two years I've been uh, involved myself is the I've come to appreciate the slowness and the time people take to make decisions and the time people take to develop things. You, you kind of come to understand that it does come down to security and protecting people's Bitcoins. Whereas I have noticed with Ethereum, there just seems to be more hacks, more smart contracts going wrong, more funds being locked up. And then subsequent to that, more discussions and debates around, you know, should there be a fork to recover funds and therefore the impact upon immutability and things like that. But it's taken me nearly two years to come to appreciate that. Do you think Ethereum has more of a startup culture in terms of move fast, break things, move on? Yeah, that's another example of the, you know, the culture, right? So that's, that's been a slogan that they've embraced from day one. And, um, and it, it kind of leads you to this problem where if it's a financial asset, what even is Ethereum? Because Ethereum 2.0 is going to be very different. Uh, you know, the serenity if that even ever happens, but but at least the plan is to make it really different. And so if you're talking about financialization, that's a huge problem. Like uh, I, I know, uh, I think it was on your podcast, uh, Trace Mayers talked about this and, and it's obvious that it's happening at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is being financialized, ETF is coming and futures and options and all those things. Uh, but Ethereum has, has none of that. Um, I guess internally they're trying to do some there's some experiments with that, but nothing from the established financial world. And the reason is that it's even hard to define what Ethereum is. And so if you're going to create a product that pertains, you know, that is going to offer Ether, what do you do if, if there's this big fork and the split and, and or if there's there's these hacks that happen? Um, and uh, I think it's like the, the futures, futures and commodities um uh, I need to look at anyway the the entity that that approves CTFC the, uh, yeah the CFTC sorry CFTC yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so the CFTC they recently put out uh, a questionnaire about e about Ethereum which has some very relevant questions so like in in and roughly speaking they're asking like what is this thing really and what are the risks of of all these hard forks and how it's upgraded um, so yeah that's another kind of thing that is going to hold Ethereum back because I think. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and especially Bitcoin, is going to shine in the next 10 years, kind of the adoption is mostly going to happen um, by means of uh, just it being part of a people's investment portfolio. And that means that large financial institutions are going to own it. And of course, there need to be wrappers that they can understand and contracts that they understand. And that means you need financialization. And so that's, I think, where where Ethereum is really underestimating the value of um, stability, predictability, being conservative. Um, and they call it, you know, kind of pejoratively, the ossification. Like we, well, maybe we'll talk about this, but like the ice age that they put in, it was like to prevent Ethereum from ossifying. Um, so, yeah. Well, listen, as you know, I, as you know, I met with Hester Peirce at the SEC to talk about a Bitcoin ETF. And we've seen the difficulty that the likes of Van Eck and the Vinkel Voss brothers have had in getting an ETF approved for Bitcoin. But my belief is going to happen at some point. It's just yeah, a matter of ticking the right boxes. I can't see a world where an Ethereum ETF would exist or be approved in its current state with all the added complexities that Ethereum brings over Bitcoin. Therefore, as an asset class, I can't see why anyone would invest in Ethereum over Bitcoin now over the next maybe at least two to three years. Unless unless um, some government uh, likes it, 
and you know and 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 in fura kind of becomes nationalized and and the miners become more or less nationalized and then we have i mean the fiat money system is already proof of stake like you know the stakeholders are the central bank and and uh, the government and to some extent the larger business banks they are the stakeholders and they decide on the money supply they in a way they can decide on all the forks if you if you want to put it that way so it's not that alien for them to have a, a stake based currency so you, you know that that might be a future i've actually i did the exercise once looking at the money supply of um, of russia and i think it's about 200 billion dollars if you put all the rubles together so you know maybe that's like the high end um uh possibility for ethereum is that they could have a 200 billion market cap if some you know fairly substantial country decides to adopt it and and kind of iron out the problems that they have and and just make it a centralized system mm, okay i think if that happens we're a long way from that uh, another thing you put in your tweet storm you you put that ethereum is a science experiment could you not argue the same about bitcoin um so the reason why i say science experiment is um that there's a difference between an engineering challenge and um trying to create something that the world has never seen before it's like trying to you know like alchemy like trying to create gold out of uh whatever aluminum like that has never been done before and so if you launch a startup that's like hey we are an alchemy startup buy shares we're going to create gold i would call that you know i would say dude that's great that you want to try that but you know find a grant go into a lab for three four years and and you know try and show some results and then do a startup right you don't ask funding for scientific experiments and so it's the same thing um you know, Ethereum, they're going to build this. Uh, I remember somebody early on in 2013 um, comparing Ethereum, that idea with NASA. It was like, sure, like exploring the stars. It's it's great. Um, but I wouldn't invest in it. Maybe now slowly with like, you know, the commercialization of space travel. But like, I mean, at least back in the 60s, would you invest in NASA if it was a startup? No, I, I don't think, I mean, maybe some people would, but it would be more like a philanthropic type idea. And I think that, um, that it really, the challenge was really, really downplayed in 2014 uh, and, and 2015. I mean, just all, all along the challenge of scaling Ethereum uh, on chain. I think that's been massively downplayed. And, and I think that a lot of investors uh, have been hurt directly or indirectly by that, or will be. So the, the contrast with Bitcoin in terms of science experiments or not, I would say is that in Bitcoin, the components were proven to work and then they were put together. And logically speaking, that should work as well. And there is never a promise that Bitcoin is going to switch to some ephemeral system that would work completely different like the main blockchain is always going to be there. It's the bedrock of the system. Whereas in Ethereum, it's like, oh, we're doing proof of work now, but you know, the promised land is coming. We're moving to proof of stake. That's that's a really big question mark if that's going to work out because proof of stake has never been proven to work in a decentralized decentralized way. And that's one of my criticisms in in the thread is that it's actually been proven that you can't do proof of stake uh, without a trusted third party. Next up, I talk to Tua further about his bearish case for Ethereum. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsor, BlockFi. And listen, as I mentioned in the intro, it's been really great talking to regular listeners about the show, how they've discovered BlockFi, how they're interested in what they're doing. Some people have told me they've signed up for their newsletter or following them on Twitter because they're interested in what they're going to do. I think they're going to be such an important company for the future of Bitcoin with the way they're integrating banking services with crypto. They also had this huge announcement before Christmas. They announced that they'd received over $4 million in funding, which they're going to use to expand their team, launch exciting new products. They've got a crypto savings account, which comes with interest rates. They've also got crypto back credit cards coming. So that's super cool. I also interviewed Zach Prince, episode 51. Definitely check that out. It isn't just a big shield for BlockFi. It's actually talking about banking and crypto. It's a really great interview. Totally worth listening to. 
So yes, I would recommend signing up to their newsletter. I would recommend following them on Twitter. Just keep an eye on what they're doing. You never know, they might actually release a product, which is something that you want to use. If you are interested in the crypto back loan, well, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender in the US. They service over 46 states and they've got interest rates as low as 7.9%. They accept Bitcoin, Ether or Litecoin as collateral. Customers can be funded in USD or GUSD, which is Gemini's dollar backed stablecoin. And you can go from application to funding in as little as 30 minutes. BlockFi is the best way to get USD funding without having to sell your crypto and applying takes less than two minutes. If you visit blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can learn more about using your crypto without selling. Well, interestingly, because of the market dynamics of trading crypto, it's almost unlikely that any early investor who invested in the ICO will have lost money. Most of them will have made decent money. It's it's the people who've come later on, whereas you don't tend to find that with traditional uh, venture investing, right? Because you don't have such liquidity early on for your projects before you've even released yeah. something. So it's more likely the later retail, or not just retail, actually, institutional venture funds that have come in in the last year, year and a half that will have, are the real ones who have been burned by this. Yeah, it's true that, you know, in, in cryptocurrencies, if you were an early investor um, in, in the top 10 coins, in any of the top 10 coins, you've done very well. Uh, and it's mostly the later ones who um, who get hurt. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of projects who uh, flared up and died. Like if you were a master coin investor, you've lost money. That That is dead, uh, even though at some point I think it did a, like a 25 X in Bitcoin. Uh, back in 2013 um so yeah it is it, and and that's the that's the problem is that later investors they they don't know the history of some of these projects um and i think yeah they're very vulnerable i think that that's where i feel a responsibility um this is a lemon market like there's lots of information but it's unevenly distributed you, how do you decide who to trust it's you know th there's no there's no rating agencies for all their flaws, right? I mean, obviously, there, that's that's you can have critiques on that as well. But but there are there's no infrastructure to evaluate these these assets, and so I think that's why if you're gonna issue an asset, you should be extra cautious. Okay, so you also moved on and talked a lot about scaling, and um, you talk about the times taken for sharding is taking so long. Is it not fair, though, to say that Bitcoin has also faced long term scaling issues like scaling was discussed very early on. Lightning has taken a long time. Do you not think that, uh, you know, Ethereum deserves a similar amount of patience? Yeah, like I think Eric Voorhees has said on Twitter, he's like, oh, you know, Ethereum is only is less than half the age of Bitcoin. Like, give it a break. Um, my response to that is that. Um, Bitcoin has never had the pretense to scale in unproven, previously unproven ways. Like modular scaling is literally how the internet scales to this day. Like from the 70s to today, that's how uh, the internet has scaled. Um, and and but but like sharding, that is it's even you know experts in sharding because like sharding is a way to store um, to store. Basically, what you do is you have a big file that you want to store, and because you don't want to lose it, you you need redundancy, and so you're going to store copies of it in different places, and and in uh, the way sharding works is that you split up the file and then you you kind of you know um, you put it in many different places, you put little parts in many different places, uh, and that works today. Like a lot of data centers use that, as far as I know. Um, but it's always with a central point of control. Like uh, uh, it's kind of like somebody has to know how the pieces fit together. And what Ethereum claims is that, well, we're going to do sharding um, in a way that's decentralized, where there's no, no trust needed to put the pieces back together. Somehow the pieces are going to know where they belong and they can kind of reconstruct themselves. And that is totally, totally unproven that you can do that and so to claim like oh we are going to transition to sharding and it's happening and i think that you know there's a huge caveat that was never mentioned uh and so it's kind of like they, they put the plane up in the air and they're like we're gonna land without a landing gear and it's gonna go great and it's never been done before but you know trust us vitalik claims they are making good progress 
Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you measure that? Like, you know, like there's a lot of, there's even like projects in crypto that are saying like, oh, we, you know, our, our models are verified, like they're verified. It's like, uh, yeah, but by which standards like you choose the what you're going to measure and then but 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 uh adam adam back likes to refer back to this um i forget the name of the law but it's basically if you have not proven to be able to break other people's systems yourself and you build a system that you claim is secure that's not a very credible claim if you're not a hacker uh, there's not a lot of credibility in you saying, oh, this is proven to be secure. It's kind of like you or I, if we were to design a, a, a vault and we're like, this is secure. I've tried breaking into it and I can't. It's like, all right, well now give it to a professional burglar. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, you, you need huge grains of salt when people make these claims like, oh, it's, it's happening. And it's because, because that's where I, in the thread, I also point at the failed, failed projects that they've just kind of moved on from it's it's always been this smorgasbord of like oh we'll do plasma or side chains or um and 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 all of them were presented as equally valid and that makes me suspicious whereas in bitcoin it's always been the consensus has gravitated towards this you know like lightning for example that there's so much enthusiasm about that and i don't see that in ether because i think they kind of they still kind of don't know so there's multiple different scaling ideas that ethereum are working on all unproven all with unknown time scales do you see a potential scenario therefore with ethereum that we could be 2020 and still nothing is delivered and it's back to the drawing board for them uh yeah yeah i mean you know it's kind of uh we'll see because i think they they are kind of trying to they're, they're kind of like the word is that they're gonna or, or the the plan is to gradually uh, ease into proof of stake. Um, like there's going to be some staking, but still proof of work and then checkpointing. And I, I don't think they'll ever, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think they'll ever make the complete transition to proof of stake. And it's basically going to be like you get a dividend paid out. It's like, it's a bit ironic because you're going to get an ether dividend, but they're going to create ether inflation to pay out the dividend. So it's kind of like zero sum, but at least, you know, I think that it was the appeal for a lot of investors. It's like, we're going to proof of stake, it's free money, uh, it's perpetual income, and we don't have to work for it, and we'll have a secure chain. And I think that's the free lunch fallacy. I think it's 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 not going to happen. So is proof of stake tied to scaling? They need proof, they can't scale with proof of work? Is that is that one of the issues? Remember, I'm not too technical. Um, it's not really, um, at least not that I've seen. It's... Um, it, it's it's not really it's just a different way to validate transactions and i guess you could say actually no it's just a different way to mine uh and and they say that you would waste a lot less electricity by doing proof of stake and that you still you have even superior security over proof of work is the claim uh but i i know it's not related to scaling in essence uh, i think it's mostly a, a part of the sales pitch it's like you know you're trying to have a really sexy product and so you say we're doing away with this wasteful mining how long has proof of stake been discussed for ethereum because it's only something i've been aware of maybe over the like predominantly over the last six months i might have heard about it before has it something that's always been on the roadmap because it, what it feels like to me now is that um the arguments that proof of work was uh, a tool for bootstrapping ethereum and now um, and now that that you know Vitalik doesn't believe in proof of work, is there a certain amount of like post rationalization going on there? Or and what I remember is, um, and I saw Vitalik in 2013 on a panel uh, in in Amsterdam, um, and uh, he it was like we're, they were talking about mining, and I remember him talking about thinking that proof of work is wasteful, and I think he liked Prime Coin because at least the algorithm was doing something useful. I think it was calculating, you know, um, trying to calculate the largest prime number. Uh, and so this idea that miners should do something useful um, has always been there. Uh, I know that. And, and that's part of why I've kind of, I've never, I thought that was, 
I thought that was flawed. Uh, I, there was like, for example, the, the pro inflation point of view, I've never really bought into that. There was a coin who had perpetual inflation uh, uh, in, in the crypto sphere in 2013, but it, it never went anywhere because investors are like, yeah, why would I buy into something that's, that's going to be diluted forever? Um, but so, yeah, so there's these notions that have always been part of Ethereum and then staking, as soon as the discussions came up about that, like, I, I would say, yes, it's from the beginning. It, it was there, this kind of plan to, to do proof of stake. Right. Okay. So I, I didn't realize that. And what what would you say is the main issue with proof of stake versus proof of work? The way that you decide on the on finality, right? You need the the final version of the ledger. How do you decide that? Well, you got to vote somehow. And in Bitcoin, it's like whoever does more work gets more voting. And so there's no way to cheat that. You have to do the work. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. You have to do the work. Uh, and then there's all kinds of other variations possible in terms of how you're going to vote. Um, and it could be like, you know, if you have an IP address, whoever runs the client, one IP address, one vote, but you can game that very easily, create a botnet and, and just have billions of votes um, or at least millions. Um, <clears throat> so proof of stake, the idea there is that if, you know, if you can prove that you own the tokens, you have skin in the game, why would you want to cheat the system? You're just going to vote uh, honestly, and then so you're not going to support double spending and, and you know, uh, um, those kind of things. But it's a political system. Like, in essence, it's a political system. I've compared it to, you know, there's this theory that underneath the pyramids um, and underneath the Sphinx in particular in Egypt, there was a library. There was like very important knowledge that they were trying to store. And so they just plunked huge amounts of rocks on top of it. Um, which in a way, uh, the amount of rocks that you pile on to something that you're trying to protect is going to be directly uh, correlated with the effort that you need to get to the secret. So in a way, it's kind of, it illustrates proof of work. So you can also imagine that the Egyptians, to protect that, they would have had a voting system and they would give an ownership to the guards. Like, oh, hey, uh, if you protect this treasure, you get a 10% stake in whatever there is and so it's like and the more you know and you get to decide how we continue to protect this treasure i mean that would have fallen apart probably in in a few decades um the political systems are very unstable and uh, and so that's my main critique is that proof of stake is just a political system and there's so many ways to game it and the more rules that you try to embed in your system to game it the more that you're actually creating obfuscated proof of work. Like, you know, it's just, you, you have a lot of hoops that they need to jump through. Well, that's just work that you build in. Um, but in, in essence, there's always going to be an incentive for people to try and game it and steal things. Um, and and the, the big thing that frightens me about proof of stake is that once you do an attack, you can rewrite the whole system. It's like, it's like you, you've done a coup d'etat, like you're in charge and you can just, it's like, oh, we have this wonderful constitution. The dictator is like, I don't care. I'll rewrite it. It doesn't matter how beautiful it looks. And so um, that's different in proof of work where you really have to, um, um, uh, you can't with a 51% attack, you can't. It's more like holding a bank hostage and you control what's going in and out. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not that easy to just rewrite the whole chain. And with proof of stake in Ethereum, am I right in thinking the more Ethereum you own, the more you can stake, the higher rewards you can get? Or is there a more even way of distributing the inflationary rewards? The more Ether you own, the more income you will have. That is the promise. Right. So those who had a received a contribution from their pre-mine aspect of the Ethereum ICO who have quite a bit of Ethereum locked up, for example, for example, Vitalik, he would do very well personally out of this. Uh, I guess so, yeah. I mean, uh, I think 70% of the Ether in circulation is still originated from the original ICO. Only, th the, only 30% has been uh, distributed to miners. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, those 70% original holders they would do very well in a stake basis and there's also a 
I think there's a minimum amount of coins that you need to be able to stake. So you could say, you know, that's going to benefit um, the early holders as well. It's like the more coins you have, the more blocks that you, you can put to work. Uh, and then, of course, they'll be they'll be trying to pool uh, as well. They'll be like mining pools. Um, but that's a huge centralization risk, right? Because if you're a mining pool uh, and you've, you're staking in the name of other people, well, you could use that power to then just do, in a way, a hostile takeover of the network if you if you're big enough. But it also seems unfair and kind of antithetical to the way Bitcoin's monetary policy has, was designed. In that, it seems to appear to be keep the rich rich, and the inflation is it twenty percent inflation? I can't remember, but that is essentially a hidden tax on everybody else. Uh, yeah, I mean, inflation you could you could call that a tax. Um, I think it, it 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 makes sense to me to to phase that out. It it makes some sense because you want to have some incentive for people to mine early on, um, but in the long run, you can just have transaction fees, and that's what's going to happen in Bitcoin. Like it, it's it's going to be the equivalent of like a one or two percent annual tax uh, spread out over everybody who is doing transactions. Um, but but I mean, I think there's always good, like people talk about the Gini coefficient. Like oh, it's I think Rubini is is. Uh, leveled this uh critique uh against bitcoin is that like there's more income inequality in bitcoin than there is in north korea it's like yeah but i think Vitalik actually had a pretty funny uh, counterpoint he was like yeah amongst the sh- the gini coefficient of the sh- cello owners of the world is also like massively skew like you know so few people in the world own cellos like that's so unfair it's a, it's just a kind of ridiculous argument anyway so i guess my point is just that there is always going to be disgruntlement with how the wealth is spread. And I, so I fundamentally, I'm not against rent. Like if I own a piece of real estate, I can rent that out. If I, if I own money, I can rent it out and get an interest rate on it. Um, to me, what, what grinds me or what rubs me the wrong way is, um, is that you pretend that it's going to create better security than proof of work. Right? And so that's where I, and also that, staking is going to be effortless um and 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 nobody has done i've never seen in ethereum like serious kind of detailed descriptions of what that's going to look like and how and i could be wrong maybe there's research i don't know about but that's just i just think that it's a way you know that's that's kind of how ponzi schemes work right they they promise perpetual income um so that's where or, or pyramid schemes, that's not the same as a Ponzi scheme. I think a, a Ponzi scheme is a subset of pyramid schemes. Um, so that's where I just kind of like, huh, like you, why are you promising perpetual income down the road? That doesn't, I just, you know, that, so that's the, that's the, and then you sell it as this eco-friendly thing. So it just, it, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't like that. Okay. Is there any risk in the process of migrating from, proof of work to proof of stake is there any risks to the whole system to people's funds is there any known risks there of course not peter what are you talking about no it's just gonna be a breeze <laughs> you just hard fork and you know and and and, and proof of work i mean no it's, i mean all joking aside it, it's still unproven like uh proof of stake itself is unproven so so it's like it's like saying we have an airplane in the sky and it's now you know, flying on kerosene and we're going to switch to nuclear, uh, nuclear energy propellants midair. And it's going to be great. <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, and of course, I mean, they, they can hard fork anything. So that's the thing is like, the easier it is, the easier it they make it look like, the more that they're proving that it's actually centralized. Because if they say, oh, whatever goes wrong, we can just fix it right away. It's like, well, how are you able to fix it so fast if you're actually decentralized? Yeah, and I uh, interviewed Brian Bishop recently, and we talked about hard forks. And there's never really been a real hard fork in Bitcoin, right? No, not really. Yeah, and it feels like every every kind of idea they uh, that's being developed they are looking at ways to soft fork i think luke dash junior found the way of soft fork in segwick right um there's a real aversion to hard forks within bitcoin yeah it seems like with ethereum and also other cryptocurrencies tokens blockchains 
there isn't such an aversion to hard forks. Yeah, hard forks are a security risk, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, you you split the chain, and you have t- all of a sudden you have two networks who use the same potentially the same mining algorithm, and so then uh, miners that are mining one chain they can just switch and attack the other chain very easily. So that's one of the risks of hard forks. And then also, um, you know, you can spend the same coins on the on both the chains. Like if you have a private key, it, it can be valid on both chains, and so. There's all kinds of ways to defraud people uh, that way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, and and then there's also the community aspect. Like I did a uh, I did a few tweets last night about um, how um, in the early '90s, uh, when the internet was just in its infancy, um, there was the World Wide Web uh, as a, a way to surf it, and then there was Gopher, um, which was an alternative um, way to. To, to browse the internet and which was more popular than the, the World Wide Web uh, for uh, several years. And part of the reason why Gopher failed was that they had a lot of forks and it just splintered the community. Um, and they had fairly poor standards as well, like development standards. Uh, the World Wide Web was a lot better. And so, and that, that gave developers more trust that there is something solid to build upon. Right. If you're going to build an application on top of the World Wide Web or HTML, that, you know, it just that's how it snowballed. And, and uh, uh, I thought that was a really interesting potential parallel with the crypto space where Bitcoin people can be fairly sure. It's, it's actually interesting that if you spin up um, a client, a Bitcoin software client from 2010, you can still connect with the network. and You can still do transactions. And so 10 years from now, if you spin up a 2018 client, you'll still be able to, you know, so that, that's, that's very clear. And, and hard forks make something no longer reverse compatible. Therefore, you have to trust the source that's going to tell you what the latest version is. Like Microsoft 10, you always need Microsoft to tell you what the latest version is to be, you know, uh, in sync with everyone. Do you think, therefore, there's a risk then when this hard fork happens that, there will be a certain group of people or or miners who will maintain a proof of work version of Ethereum. Yeah, absolutely. And and they knew that from early on. And they, that's part of my critique in the tweet storm is that they built in this, the ice age. It was like, you know, or they called it a difficulty bomb. Like, you know, in 2018, Ethereum difficulty automatically is going to exponentially increase therefore and making mining useless and it's going to force miners to switch, to agree to switch to proof of stake. That was the plan. And uh, and it was built in and then they weakened it and then they removed it. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, it's like political promises. It's, it really shows that it's, it's, there's a lot of politics there where, oh yeah, we'll reduce taxes down the road. Look, we promise it. Here's a piece of paper that promises it, but you can always fork the laws and so in the same sense, they just forked the code and, uh, and took it out. And so now there is no incentive for miners to, to do proof of stake. They'll have all these machines that mine Ether. So there's somebody is going to come up and say, Ether, I don't know how they're going to call it because we already have Ether Classic. Um, but yeah, they're going to call it something. Classic, e- Ether Classic, or who knows? Ether Classic Cash. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that'll be it. Let's uh, maybe we can start printing the T-shirts already. But you know what, Arthur? The thing that really stands out to me here, as somebody who does struggle a lot with the technical side of things, is that there seems to be a beauty in the simplicity, therefore, of what Bitcoin is, and this whether you call it entrepreneurial spirit or greed. But people have wanted to replicate Bitcoin or the success of, I say, the the blockchain. And therefore, they've tried to build other things, and they've had to they've had to have some differentiators, right? They've had to do something different to stand out. But it kind of comes back to the fact that most of them have created either something that's highly complex, and therefore runs into all different kinds of new issues with monetary policy or scaling, or it's too similar to Bitcoin, and therefore will have no use case. Therefore, this is where I I kind of start to sympathise with Bitcoin maximalism in that. The blockchain, I think it was in your tweet storm even, that Gregory Maxwell thing you said, the blockchain really is there for uh, just for securing information, like monetary information, not for large-scale computation. 
Do you see where I'm going? Yeah, and, and I, I like the word, maybe I should increasingly start using that. I like the word Bitcoin minimalism. <laughs> um, it's kind of like saying that you can do this stuff with Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is very inclusive. It just, it takes more work to do it in Bitcoin and kind of like live up to that standard. Um, but like we're seeing it with Lightning now, you can do payments in Bitcoin. You don't need to create a new blockchain, a payments friendly blockchain. You can do micro payments in Bitcoin. It just takes a lot of work to do it. Uh, the same with smart contracts, the same with asset issuance, the same with privacy friendly applications. You don't need your own privacy blockchain, uh, but you know it takes more work to do it. But but so it's this um, double edged sword. Like it's it's very inclusive, but you know there's a meritocracy and you have to work your way up. And uh, but that's the beauty of modularity as well. If you want to build a side chain, just go ahead. You know, nobody's going to stop you. If you want to build a lightning client, go ahead. Um, whereas in, in a lot of altcoins, it's a lot more like, oh, we want this functionality and that. And then you have to ask permission. Bitcoin is going to be ossified pretty much as a protocol in a few years. Like it's not going to change at all. So there will be nobody left to ask permission to at some point. Um, but you can create modules that link into the, the main chain and then, you know, then the sky's the limit. So it's almost like, you know, a lot of people like to compare this crypto era with the dot-com era. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But one thing that does kind of stand out, it almost feels like, therefore, Bitcoin is the, the internet, right? We don't need people to create 15 different internets. It's almost like Bitcoin is the, the internet. Yeah. We have Bitcoin and you can build all your monetary uh, products and tools and smart contracts within that, but have one kind of crypto financial system and and therefore allow bitcoin to focus on what the most important things is which is decentralization censorship resistance it doesn't make sense to have lots of different internets yeah exactly i, I totally agree um you know um uh and people forget like bill gates was very excited about the information super highway you know and that was not the internet that we have today that was that the equivalent of that was private blockchains, permission blockchains. It was going to be corporate networks that were kind of going to link with each other, but it was all going to be kind of like walled gardens. Uh, and he thought maybe one walled garden would win out or there'll be a patchwork of them. That didn't happen. And so, um, and, 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 and the idea of like, oh, Gopher and TCP and, and the World Wide Web that they would all uh, kind of coexist, that didn't happen either. It's like this network effect is brutal. It just kind of, it just snowballs um, and it makes sense. Like, I mean, there's not, there's not 10 different types of containers that dominate world trade. It's just one, one very particular format of containers. I think there's actually a few, so I mean, that might not be the greatest, um, the greatest metaphor, but um, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, it's very powerful to think of Bitcoin as um, uh, one of the core bottom layers of a financial internet. Very cool. One thing I often ask people, and it feels relevant here, is why do so many seemingly smart people have this wrong? Or could you be wrong? But why do so many smart people seemingly have this wrong? There seem to be so many people invested in different protocols, networks, coins, tokens, funds are doing it, different VCs. How can so many people who are seemingly smart be wrong? Do you think some of them know they're wrong or do you think they absolutely fundamentally believe in what they're doing? I think it's a combination. Um, I think if you get paid to be wrong, it's, it's easier. <laughs> and, um, and, and so that doesn't mean that they don't believe in what they're doing, but it's kind of like people see financial remuneration often as a validation that they're right. And so if, if you launch an altcoin and, you know, it, it goes to the stratosphere because you believe in it and people invest in it, then it's kind of hard to look in the mirror and be like, what if I'm totally wrong? Like you have all these people around you who, who are cheering you on. And, and I think eventually you kind of, it becomes part of your identity. You're like, oh, this is who I am. And, and so, um, and then it's kind of up to the market to eventually punish you and be like, hey, dude, you, I think you were actually wrong. <laughs> like this, this thing is now down 95, 98, 99 percent. You know, you're probably wrong. Um, but until that comes, like, yeah, 
uh, if you get rewarded for being wrong, that that is it's very hard to then change your ways. Um, and 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 at the same time, I think there's also there's there it, it makes sense to see if there's a gap there. If Bitcoin is going to be dominant, but only ninety percent, well, what is that ten other percent going to be? Because if if you know the Bitcoin space, whatever, if Bitcoin is going to ten trillion, then that ten percent is going to be one trillion dollars worth of value. And if you find one startup that's going to be even a small part of that ten percent, you could take it from you know five million to. Uh, 20 billion, right? You could write that up and you will massively outperform Bitcoin. So it does make sense that there's a gold rush for people to try and find like, you know, what is that one niche uh, niche that, that Bitcoin does not cover? Can we, can we do something there? Because Bitcoin is already there. So, so, uh, so I think that's, that's, that's actually a valid, uh, a valid uh, pursuit. Do you think it's a shame that Vitalik isn't involved in Bitcoin? I mean, it's hard to tell. Like he never was. Like I mean, uh, Bitcoin core developers will tell you. Like Vitalik was never involved in in, in Bitcoin development. Um, is it a shame? I, I don't know if it's a big loss because he he doesn't seem to be um, like those like boring standard. I think he he may be just too impatient. Like I think it's not a. a, a I don't know if his personality fits. Um, so I don't know, and and it's. I don't even know how how good a developer he is uh, when it comes to you know building these robust um, systems. I'm definitely glad that there's competition out there. Like I love that people just you know put their money where their mouth is and, and go for it. Um, I'm just trying to you know just kind of do what I can in terms of to try to keep the the debate honest and and to try and help people be informed. Okay. Well, I think this has been very useful to go go through it in detail and discuss it with you. I understand a lot more. Just the last couple of questions for us to close out. So, do you have a conflict of interest to her? Uh, well, I mean, I, I've I've been known to short Ether every now and then. I've, I've shorted Ether against Bitcoin. Uh, I did that in, I think it was 2016 and then again uh, 2018. Um, cause I see it kind of as a proxy for the whole altcoin space. It's kind of cool how it, 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 um, it moves like that, but right now I'm, I'm totally flat. Uh, I don't have any, any skin in the game. Uh, no, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm known to be a Bitcoiner, so I, I have Bitcoin. Um, so it's like, it's, it's like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't like you're damned if you disclose because people say, Oh, look, you, you have something writing on this, or if you put up a trade, uh, but then if you don't disclose then people are also mad that you're, you know, you may have hidden interests. So you can't please everyone. All right, man. Any closing thoughts you'd want to add to this? Um, no, I just want to, I guess I would say that I, I want to cultivate, you know, uh, being, being um, precise a little more in, in the wording that I use. Like I think sometimes when I reread things it's like, huh, that was a little bit snarky. Like I get to kind of polish that out. So I just want to, that's kind of what I take away from this is that I've noticed that there's a specific words that people have noted, seen and, um, and that, you know, there may be angry or heard about. So I want to, I want to, you know, do better in that regard. We could, we could give that a name. We could call it Tour complete. <laughs> that's my, uh, that's my dad joke. But that's my uh, as, long, as long as we don't do an ICO, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, listen, let's, so um, what are you looking forward to in 2019? And how can people get in touch, talk to oh, you? Oh, 2019? Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. I mean, I think we're in the accumulation phase uh, of Bitcoin. I think this is where the, the smart money is, um, is, um, is, is putting, you know, chips on the table. Um uh there's enormous amount of development happening in bitcoin there's really interesting startups as well um we're gonna see i mean one of the big things is is institutional custody like that is really going to happen in 2019 it's so exciting we're going to see a lot better insurance as well for deposits so all these puzzle pieces are starting to come into place for bitcoin to really start shining eventually as a reserve asset really as as a you know, first as a savings instrument, but long-term as a reserve asset. 
um, and and in a way this the water retreating like that's kind of you know the the buffet metaphor is like you know if the tide um, goes back in the ocean you see who's swimming naked like I think this is a very healthy process where um, the money is drying up and we're kind of seeing who survives and who doesn't uh, it was very it, it can similar thing happened in 2014-15 uh, and it's just very healthy. It's it's part of the creative destruction, and it helps people focus. And I mean, this period is it's so great to do business as well. Like people have time, they pick up the phone. <laughs> Whereas, like you know, in December last year, it's like you, there was nobody. You could, nobody was to be reached um, if you needed to get things done. So yeah, I'm just super stoked. Uh, I think Bitcoin could go sideways for a bunch longer. Uh, but but um, in terms of value, I think yeah, Bitcoin is at is at fair value. Um, so yeah, just exciting times, and and I mean it's just such an amazing community to to just be part of. It's just so fun to to talk to people and exchange ideas, and and it's it's bigger and stronger than ever. And I guess you're happy to debate the Ethereum subject with people as long as it's in a uh, friendly, non-aggressive um, kind of a civil way, right? Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the most informed person in the world when it comes to Ethereum. It's not my, my day job at all. Um, so there's definitely, you know, there's definitely things that I can learn still uh, and things that I might've gotten really wrong. Okay, cool. So how can people stay in touch? Who do you want to hear from? Yeah, just, uh, I'm on Twitter pretty much every day, so you can find me there. Oh, and I, I'm Medium as well. I have a Medium blog. Yes, you do. I remember. I've read a lot of that. I've read a lot of that for our first one. So, well, listen, thank you. And also just, you know, personally, thank you. We've spoken a few times offline since our first interview. Uh, appreciate your support. Thank you for coming on. Uh, wish you and your family a, a happy new year. And uh, I look forward to seeing you sometime in 2019. Thanks, Peter. Likewise. Okay then, so what did you make of that? Do you agree with Tua? Do you disagree with Tua? I do think it's right that we do challenge these technologies, especially when people can and have lost money not really understanding what they're investing in. And listen, this isn't just about altcoins and tokens. Bitcoin too should be challenged. I think anyone in the Bitcoin community would agree with that. Everything should be challenged. Everything should be debated. These are volatile markets. It's very easy to lose a lot of money. I know that, not just from my own experience, but speaking to other people. Listen, I'm not entirely sold on the Ethereum as a completely a scam. There's certainly things being built which people will use. I know DAI is making a lot of progress. It's gaining a lot of traction. So you may be ardently against stable coins, but this is a free market. If people are creating things that people can use, then so be it. Like, let's let's see what can happen. But I'm not completely sold yet. So let's see. Also, as I said in the intro, I'm more than happy to debate this from the other side. Look, if someone in the Ethereum community, obviously I'd love Vitalik, but he, you know, he might not even care or know about my show. But I would love someone from the Ethereum community to come on and debate from the other side. I'm always here to learn. I think it's the only the fair thing to do. So listen, if you do want to do that, if you're entrenched in the community, you're someone that was, would be appropriate for the show, please do reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. If you haven't heard my show before, you can check out previous interviews. I'm always fair. I always give everyone a fair chance and try and do the most balanced interview I can. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, if you want to support the show, there's always a bunch of things you can do. Firstly, the most important thing you can do is listen to the sponsors. If you are a regular listener and you jump the ads, maybe in future, just give them a listen. You know, the advertisers pay for me to do this. They want to get into your ear. So just check them out. Secondly, you can become a patron. I've got 61 now. This is absolutely insane. It grows every week. If you want to become a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. There's a bunch of different options there. Also, feel free to reach out to me if you've got any questions. If you want to subscribe to the show, you want to get the ad free version, you want to get it early, but you don't want to use Patreon. I've got a couple of people who pay by Bitcoin. So just feel free to email me. I can get you on the mailing list for that. That's not a problem. You can also leave me a review on iTunes or you can click on the subscribe button. Both help with my ranking in iTunes when people are searching for shows related to what I'm doing. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Medium, I'm on Twitter, I'm at what Bitcoin did on everything. Also, my personal Twitter is at Peter McCormack. You can reach out to me. DMs are always open. Happy to talk to anyone who doesn't want me to shill something. You can check out my website. Loads of useful stuff on there. Always adding stuff to it. Always adding resources to help people learn more. And you can sign up to my newsletter. Lastly, you can share the show out with your friends and family. Every time you do this, this is super useful. So look, I really appreciate everyone who does anything to support the show. Okay, a couple of cool interviews coming up. 
I've got Matt O'Dell and Neil Woodfine talking about what we're going to see for Bitcoin 2019. I've got an interview with Mike Dudas from The Block talking about crypto journalism. I've got an interview with John Carvalho discussing defending Bitcoin. And also at the start of February, I've got my series coming, which is looking at the 10 year anniversary of Bitcoin, looking what we want to see over the next 10 years with leaders in Bitcoin. So loads and loads of cool stuff happening. Feel free to reach out to me if you've got any ideas, you want to discuss anything. I pretty much will respond to anyone as long as you don't ask me to shield some stupid project. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and I look forward to hearing from you. 